Our next speaker, Aviu Dekel from the Hebrew University, it's a work with Gaia Cohen, Ofer Yehuda, and Daphna Weinshel. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, one second. Okay, so, hi. Uh, my name is Aviu Dekel. I'm a master's graduate from the Hebrew University. And I'll present today a joint work with Gaia Cohen and Professor Daphna Weinschel. It's called Active Learning on a Budget, Opposite Strategies Suit High and Low Budgets. And it was accepted into ICML 22. Okay, so let's start with the outline. So we'll start with some uh, background, the motivation, what is active learning and some prior work. And then we'll start talking about uh, the paper's contributions, which is a theoretical analysis, a method, and experimental results, and then we'll summarize. Okay, so let's start with the motivation. So consider the case of semantic segmentation. Um, in this case, the collection of images is fairly cheap. You just have cars and they drive and collect data. Uh, in contrast, the annotation is time-consuming and therefore it's expensive. So in this case, the annotations are the bottleneck in our, uh, our pursuit to improve performance. So our, uh, what we want is maximal performance with minimal annotations, okay? So one way of achieving that is with active learning. So active learning works as follows. We have a large unlabeled data and some fixed budget, which is fairly small. And then we can select some of the samples to be annotated. It, and this is where, this is the main idea, this is where we interfere. Usually people select the labeled set at random. And this is uh, what active learning claims to be too naive, okay? Uh, random selection is not uh, good enough. So after we selected the samples, we uh, simply train our supervised model, and if we would select a good labeled set, we would get uh, more likely a better model. Okay, so sometimes active learning is viewed as a cycle. Uh, you start with an uh, unlabeled pool, and then uh, traditionally you select the initial set randomly, then you get some labeled examples, you train a model, and you use the model uh, that you train to select additional samples. So you repeat this procedure, uh, uh, query samples, train a model on the samples you created, and use the model again to query more. Okay, so let's talk about some prior work. We'll talk mainly about leading principles in active learning. So one principle is uncertainty sampling, where we select samples that the model is least confident about. Um, so in this example, you see that some uh, samples in color are already labeled in blue or in uh, red, and the uh, black ones are unlabeled. And we have the uh, predictions of the model uh, that we trained already. So in uncertainty sampling, we would select the samples closest to the decision boundary to be annotated. So another uh, leading principle in active learning is diversity sampling, where we try to minimize the correlation between samples that we annotate. And this is uh, done to avoid redundancy in annotation because we don't want to label two examples that are very similar. Uh, we'll have uh, the added value of the second one would be fairly small. Now we'll talk about uh, a problem in, uh, in active learning, which is called the cold start problem, okay? So given a small annotation budget, active learning strategies don't improve over random selection. So they only work when the initial labeled set is very large and you want to query even more examples. Uh, so in here you see an example for the cold start problem. Uh, this is an active learning experiment on CIFAR 100. And in the x-axis you see the number of examples and in the y-axis the test accuracy. Um, so the initial set is selected randomly, and then we follow uh, five iterations, active learning iterations, where we query 100 samples more. And this is done with different active learning strategies, for example, margin, core set, etc. 
And you see that in black, the random is the top performing uh, model, which is not what we expect in active learning. We want to improve over random selection. So this is a problem. And I would say it's important to state that these methods actually work, but only if the budget, for example, was 5,000 examples and we would query each time 5,000 examples, uh, these methods would improve over random selection. So we suggest a new active learning strategy called TPCLAST, which improves over random selection and overcomes this cold start problem. And this is interesting because uh, some tasks are inherently low budget, where we have a busy expert and we can't ask him to query a lot of examples and we still want to utilize their time in the best way possible. Okay, now we reach the state where we start to talk about our paper and uh, this paper aims to explain and solve the cold start problem. Uh, we'll start with the theoretical analysis. So uh, consider the abstract case uh, where we have a data distribution and we split it into two distinct regions, R1 and R2. One of them is learned fast and the other one is learned slower and we assume that both of them are independently learned. Okay, so I said that they are learned fast or slow so we need to define the pace of learning and we formalize that using an error score. So an error score is a function that takes as input m, the number of examples, and returns the expected generalization error using random m samples. And you see here the expectation over the selection of random m samples from the data distribution. And when we say that R1 is learned faster than R2, we mean that its error score decays faster. This is one way to define it, but maybe uh, it's easier to look at the function and see that the orange function of R1, the error score of the orange one, decays faster than the blue error score. Okay, so uh, why, uh, how is this connecting to active learning? So we, in this theoretical setup, we uh, view active learning as a biased sampling strategy. Okay, so uh, we want to uh, minimize the overall error and we have the following dilemma. Should we sample, oversample R1, the part that is learned fast, or oversample the other part which is learned slower? And uh, the way it connects to the active learning literature is that oversampling R2, the learned slow part, is analogous to uncertainty sampling where we try to select the samples that are harder to learn or learned slower. Okay, so which one should we choose, R1 or R2, to minimize the overall error? And the answer is that it depends, and specifically it depends on the number of examples. So in here you see x-axis is the number of examples again, and the y-axis is the difference in accuracy from random selection. So above the black line it's improving, and below the black line it's worse than random selection. So. When we oversample R2, we gain benefits in high budgets, but we are actually worse in low budgets. And when we oversample uh, R1, the area, the, the region that is learned fast, we have benefits in low budgets, but we are worse in high budgets. So we have kind of a phase transition phenomenon in here. So the optimal strategy that we need to choose in this case, in this uh, example, shifts. Uh, as a function of the budget. Okay, so uh, we see the same phenomenon when we uh, do the same experiment only empirically. So this is when using uh, our active learning strategy in orange and an uncertainty sampling uh, strategy in blue and we plot the difference from accuracy from random selection in, uh, when training neural networks on CIFAR-10. So we prove several results and one of them is that if we want to determine, given a number of examples, what is the optimal strategy, we can do that using a simple threshold test uh, and P and alpha are parameters of the problem. And we have a phase transition guarantee when the error score is smooth, monotone and bounded by an exponential. Okay, and we prove that 
linear classifiers error score is bounded by an exponential, and we show empirically that the error score of neural networks classifiers is also bounded by an exponential. So let's sum up this section. We claim that there is an opposite strategy for high and low budgets. So in high budget, we agree with ac the active learning literature. We should, in high budget, select uncertainty, should perform uncertainty sampling, focus on the uncommon examples. However, we predict a new thing, that in low budgets, we should focus on the representative examples that are easier to learn. Okay, so now we want to select the samples that are easier to learn, but we come across to a problem that we don't have any labels or we have a very small amount of labels. So we need somehow to model confidence without a model, okay? So the way we do it is we replace the notion of confidence, which requires a model and therefore labels, with the notion of density, which can be calculated in an unsupervised manner. Okay, so what we do is we oversample dense regions to select representative examples. So let's walk through our method, which is called TPCLAST, typical clustering. It works as follows. It tries to uh, select different peaks of the data distribution in the following way. We start with a representation learning algorithm to learn a semantically meaningful representation space. Then, assuming we want to select 30 samples, for example, then we cluster the data into 30 clusters. And from every cluster, we select the densest example. And this results in the selection of a diverse and representative set of examples. Okay, now we look at some results. Uh, so you see here uh, in purple and in blue, you see our method, TPCLAST, with two variants which differ in the clustering algorithm they use. And you see that all of the active learning, other active learning methods are worse or on par with random because these experiments are low budget experiments. The number of examples here is one sample per class. And you see that uh, our method, TPCLAST, outperforms their random selection and all the other active learning strategies and is able to overcome the cold start problem. Um, we also consider the case of semi-supervised active learning where the literature reports there is no benefits from this combination. So again, in active learning we select a set of samples and we still have a large unlabeled set. So we can apply a semi-supervised learning algorithm as well. And I said that this uh, didn't show improvements uh, before, but now using the right active learning strategy for low budgets, we see large improvements. So let's look at the results. Uh, in here, in uh, blue and purple again, you see the two variants of our method. For example, on CIFAR 10, random selection uh, gets us to less than 60% uh, accuracy. And using the same number of examples selected, selected in a more sophisticated way, we are able to uh, boost the accuracy to above 90%. And we get the same uh, important boosts in different data sets. And this graph summarizes our accuracy improvements from random selection, which is again in low budgets, the top performer, top active learning strategy. And you see here uh, results on six different data sets and with three uh, training frameworks. So we have semi-supervised where the boosts are fairly large. Self-supervised embedding is a linear classifier uh, on a, on a self-supervised uh, feature vectors and a fully supervised training only on the label set. Okay, so let's summarize. Uh, Using active learning can show large improvements. So if you have a, a, an annotation project going on, you should consider using it. It shows large benefits. Prior work in low budget active learning show no benefits at all. And now using our method, which does the opposite of other methods, we obtain uh, large benefits. And uh, yeah, it's a, a interesting observation that uh, low budget strategies are opposite to high budget strategies. And I guess it's uh, uh, 
highly uh, related to the way we learn. If you would have a uh, few resources on teaching someone a subject, you would probably uh, focus on simple representative examples instead of the edge cases, which are harder to understand and not only take those. In, so this is the way in low budget. And we have another work, a uh, follow-up work, uh, that was accepted to NeurIPS that formulates the, this problem as a coverage problem. And this will be a subject of another talk. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a single question. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, how do you know how many examples uh, do you need to transition between the low budget and the high budget? Yeah, okay, now I see you. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting uh, question because uh, indeed uh, you are correct to identify the number of examples for a low and high budget. It depends on the difficulty of the task and the size of the data set, etc. And this is indeed uh, an ongoing uh, line of uh, research. Uh, so we have uh, several uh, ideas, but no, not something uh, conclusive yet. So this is an active research uh, direction uh, the lab is currently focusing on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let us uh, thank the speaker again.